Our guest is Akbar Ahmed. He's the chair of Islamic Studies at American University. He's also the former High Commissioner to the United Kingdom and Ireland from Pakistan and author of the new book, The Thistle and the Drone, How America's War on Terror Became a Global War on Tribal Islam. Should I say ambassador? Should I say I the doctor? First, first time, Denison, after that you can. Uh, can I say Akbar? Absolutely. Thank after you. the first time, just get that out of the way. <laughs> but uh, tell the folks that, uh, how you were ambassador. Yes, um, uh, High Commissioner or Ambassador is the same title. I was Pakistan's High Commissioner to the UK, UK and Ireland. And, but you are an American citizen, yes, of course. Yes, now I am, yes. And uh, Chair of Islamic, Islamic Studies at American University. Yeah. Absolutely. So, so we want to take advantage of the fact that you have spent so much time trying to educate yeah. Americans about Islam. Yes. Uh, what are the basic beliefs of Islam? What are the basic teachings of the Prophet? The basic principles derive from the Judeo-Christian tradition. Certain thou shalt and thou shalt nots. Basically, a life of piety, showing compassion, particularly compassion towards the poor, towards the neighbors, the family, uh, constantly remembering that we are here on this earth for a short time and therefore walking in humility with a soft tread, as it were, and above all, being good human beings, avoiding, avoiding violence. I want to emphasize this because to me, as a Muslim scholar, Islam is a religion of compassion and peace theologically. Uh, God's two greatest names out of the 99 names he has in the Quran are Haman and Rahim, which mean compassion and mercy. So God describes himself as merciful and compassionate. All right, so we have that in our minds. Let's move along to tribal societies. What are they, who are they? This relationship between tribal Islam and orthodox Islam is a fascinating one, especially for me as an anthropologist. Islam emerges in the seventh century in a highly tribal society. The prophet of Islam is tribal, and he is conscious that he's bringing a universal religion with universal principles, transcending race and religion and color, and so, not religion, but race and color and tribe. And yet he is having to work all this out within a highly traditional tribal society. So he in fact says, there's a famous saying of his, there is no Bedouinism in Islam. Mm -hmm. Bedouinism meaning this, the tribes, the Bedouin tribes. And in time, the tribes of the peninsula become Muslim and therefore they absorb Islam, so the rhetoric will be Muslim, they'll say their prayers according to the uh, principles of Islam and so on. But many of the customs of tribalism permeate into Islam. Let me ask this question then. Uh, we're getting to the gold. What is the code of the tribe? Exactly. The tribe functions around a code, a code of honor. The code of honor is primarily hospitality, showing courage, manhood, Revenge. Revenge is crucial for the code. For example, in the Pashtun, Pathans in East Afghanistan, in North Pakistan, there's a famous saying, I took revenge after a hundred years and I took it too quickly. So the, the code of revenge remains highly developed in tribal society. So you can see how Islam would say compassion, mercy at all costs to transcend and to trump everything. And tribalism would say, no, we must take revenge. Let me ask this question then. Revenge, can revenge be equated with justice? No. Justice means an impartial observ observance of a judge, an appointed judge who must come to a decision based on the evidence. Revenge means an individual deciding that a, an injustice has been done to me, I am going to take the law into my own hands and commit an act, perhaps, of violence. Why is that so necessary in the tribal society? Because tribal society, which may seem anarchic, also has a balance, and that is the elders of the society. Mm -hmm. And these are all lineage-based. All the elders belong to the tribe, and everyone knows who everyone else is. So the elders form what is called the council of elders, and they maintain stability and peace in the tribe. And therefore, the code of revenge is always contained and checked by the elders in society. Okay, so we have Islam, 
We have the tribal societies, and now central governments. What are the central governments? Now, central governments emerged really in the 19th and 20th century with first the colonial powers arriving from Europe to colonize parts of Africa and Asia, and then in the modern 20th century, the modern state. The modern state essentially a European concept which gives or set, supposed to give rights to every individual citizen that belongs to that state, uh, rights to education, employment, mm -hmm. health, and so on. The reality was that many of these tribes now belong to nations which have been carved out of uh, 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 vast regions, sometimes borders, national borders, cutting across tribes. So one clan is on one side, one on the other side, and these tribes are not easily incorporated. So they find themselves deprived, impoverished, very often their natural resources now grabbed by the central government, which then continue to persecute them and suppress them and in fact ignore their local language, customs, and even give them, uh, treat them very harshly. Okay, so we have on the table now Islam, tribal societies, and now the central governments. And if folks can maybe get into their minds as we go to the break, Aceh in Indonesia, uh, Waziristan in Pakistan, uh, what would be a couple of others that we, oh, Chechnya, we could put Chechnya on Absolutely. the table. Russia and Chechnya. And so these are operating as kind of autonomous groups. The central government comes along and they marginalize them, don't respect them. And then we're leading our conversation to 9-11 because that was key. Take a little break, back on the other side, a fascinating conversation, a very, very important book, Akbar Ahmed, The Thistle and the Drone. This is an amazing piece of work that is getting so much attention. Sit tight, we'll be back on the other side. This is America is brought to you by the National Education Association the nation's largest advocate for children and public education. The Republic of Kazakhstan in the heart of Eurasia, a rich history, a culture of hospitality, and a future of development and growth. The U.S.-China Education Trust and the F.Y. Chang Foundation. The League of Arab States, representing 350 million people in 22 member countries. The Rotondaro Family Trust. The Embassy Series, uniting people through musical diplomacy, presenting international artists in diplomatic settings. Let's take a look at 9-11 and the people who were involved in hijacking those planes and crashing them into the Trade Center, or the Pentagon, and the goal was the White House, huh? Who are these people of the, I guess, 19 people, right? 19 people, Dennis, and this is what is remarkable. Very few people know their background. Of the 19, 18 are straight tribesmen. Osama bin Laden, tribesmen. The rhetoric he uses, the clues he gives us, tribal, tribal, tribal. His rhetoric is full of references to raiding parties, honor, courage, and revenge. And here's another clue. The last two houses he lives in, in the 90s, in Afghanistan, and then in Pakistan, in uh, Abbottabad, are named after tribes. The first one is Gamdi House, Yemeni tribe, and the second one is Waziristan, after mm -hmm. the tribes Wazir and Masood who live in Waziristan. So again, you have a very strong tribal element within the Islamic rhetoric and the Islamic uh, talk of these um, uh, Al-Qaeda people. You have a very strong tribal base to that organization. And Us uh, Osama's own um, uh, staff said that uh, something like 90 to 95 percent of Al-Qaeda were in fact Yemeni tribesmen. Okay. We were just in Oman. We did some programs. We interviewed the foreign minister. And he was quick to, because Yemen borders on Oman, I brought that up into the conversation, and he almost uh, shook his head, but he was saying that here we are thinking that uh, democratic principles can be achieved in a tribal society. Now, I contend this. So 9-11 comes along, and 
tremendous loss of life. The United States must retaliate in some way. Bin Laden bends the rules. Does he not? Does he not make? He he morphs it into a religious war, but it really isn't a religious war. Exactly. Bin because let me just put this on the table because I think it's I picked this up in your book, the killing of innocent people and suicide is totally and completely against Islam. Dennis, there's a fascinating conversation with bin Laden, with some correspondents, straight after 9-11, mm -hmm. in which the correspondent tries to pin him down and says, according to Islam, you cannot kill women and children, mm -hmm. certainly not innocent women and children. Mm -hmm. And bin Laden wriggles around, and then in the end he says, yes, all right, the prophet may have said this, but... Now, as you know, Dennis, in religion, whether it's Judaism, Christianity, or Islam, you don't have buts. You either accept God or you don't. You accept the divine rules or don't. Now, when the Prophet says you cannot kill women and children, no Muslim has the authority to then set that aside and say, yeah, but these circumstances are different. Now, with that but, Osama bin Laden opens up a whole theological debate, which I found fascinating, was not then pounced upon by scholars and uh, analyzed and said, okay, if this isn't the case, where do we look for clues? And the clues lead us straight to this tribal base of Osama himself. Remember his grandfather is escaping his tribal village in the Yaban. Uh, he's so poor he can't even afford to pay for a, uh, an animal. He ends up um, coming to Saudi Arabia. His son then becomes a, a multimillionaire. And Osama's father then becomes almost like a tribal sheikh in his own Yemeni uh, tribes. But we're not giving, uh, because they are tribal people, uh, and they kill thousands of people here in the United States, as I say, United States must re retaliate. Uh, they go into Afghanistan, hunting the Al-Qaeda. Uh, Taliban is in there as well. A lot of the people in Afghanistan flee to Pakistan. There is a war on terror. Bush names it the war on terror. I think, Dennis, here is where different narratives come into play. The United States must retaliate. It has been unjustly, unfairly attacked. It's mm -hmm. a terrible tragedy. Thousands of innocent people dead. But then it charges off into Afghanistan and goes straight into a tribal confrontation, tribal configurations that are as ancient as history. You have the Pashtun tribes, the dominant ethnic group of Afghanistan, don't forget, Afghanistan is named after the Afghans, the land of the Afghans or the Pashtuns. The United States arrives not knowing all this background and goes charging into a confrontation with the Pashtuns because the Taliban are coming from the Pashtun. And the Northern Alliance, who are non-Pashtun tribes, are now then allied with the United States. And overnight, the United States is seen as a tribal player in a tribal war. And because of that, until today, a decade after, the longest war in history, billions of dollars, thousands of lives, we are still facing a situation where every day soldiers are killed from NATO, green and blue killings have increased, and we are far from having a satisfactory situation on the ground. So when the, 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 the Al-Qaeda goes into the area of Pakistan that you know so well, Waziristan, and they are indeed hiding amongst uh, the tribal uh, folks there, and the United States starts to use the drones and the steamroller. Um, how? That's a legitimate, isn't it? A legitimate going after the enemy. The enemy must be taken care of. Exactly. The question is, how do you take care of it? I was in charge of those areas. Mm -hmm. I faced exactly similar situations. How did you handle it back in the late 70s? I handled it, Dennis. I handled really bad characters who, in their own way, were as notorious as perhaps even more than uh, Osama, uh, through tribal networks, through using the tribes, their elders, the jirgas, religious leaders, but working within the tribal system. Because ultimately, if you just use plain force, you're not going to get anywhere very far. For the time being, yes, not too far. Because you take the Waziristan situation. The drones start really in 2004. At the same year, you have the Pakistan army then coming in, sending hundreds of thousands of troops. Uh, you now have into Pakistan. Into Waziristan. Into Waziristan. Now go back to the other frame I'm using in this book, center versus periphery. Mm -hmm. And we must remember we are looking not just at one tribal society. I'm looking at 40 
tribal societies. 40. From, 40 from Morocco right into Central Asia. And the pattern is the same, center versus periphery. And now, after 2004, you have the central government marching about in the tribal areas, and the tribal structure, that's the lineage elders, the religious leaders, and the political administration, which I represented, mm -hmm. these three pillars of authority are weakened and after 2004, effectively destroyed. In that vacuum, you have the emergence of the TTP, mm -hmm. perhaps the most virulent and dangerous of the Taliban strains. And the TTP are from those tribes, and they are deadly warriors, so that they begin these suicide bombers, send them into Karachi, Lahore, into the soft targets, mm -hmm. buses, school children, mosques. And you really now have a serious crisis in Pakistan. So drone strikes, killing two or five or 10 bad guys, and losing 100, 200, 500 people who now become determined enemies of the United States. So when you do the ledger, you take out five and you lose 500 who now become enemies. I make no uh, defense of uh, the terror, uh, the um, harm that has been caused on the United States in this horrible war. So I make no defense for the tribal societies and this concept of revenge. But I do believe history repeats itself. Let's go back to Spain, Morocco, and France in 1912 and 1921. Tell the folks what happened. Where was this you're talking about? Spain, Morocco, and France was involved as well. In all these countries. The Berbers. Yeah, in all these countries, Dennis, apply the same model. You That's have the central government, you have a colonial force at that time representing the central government, and you have, like in Pakistan, Waziristan, you have Pashtun tribes, there you have the Berbers, and exactly the same pattern. The central government goes in, brutalizes the population, may kill 100,000, 200,000 people using gas and all kinds of terrible things. And for the time being, there's a lull. And then very quickly, the Berbers hit back. Mm -hmm. And they hit back, they'll attack towns, they'll attack. Two things are happening here. The central government is failing to treat their own people on the periphery as citizens with dignity, with compassion, and with equality. They're treating them with a lot of contempt. The tribal and the periphery, the, the populations there, are also re re rejecting the central government, rejecting modernity. And here you have a failure of leadership on both sides. Yes, yes, Not yes. just a failure on one yes. side. And along they have their responsibilities absolutely. as well. Absolutely. Right? I do not want to exonerate yes. their failures, mm -hmm. their treatment of women, their treatment. They've got all, lots of problems, which I discuss in this book. Mm -hmm. But the question is this. We have to sit back, Dennis. We have to sit back and not be so emotional in the analysis. We have to say, here we have 40 case studies. This is the data mm -hmm. which we lined up side by side, juxtaposed it. Let's draw the conclusions. So when you go to the Pentagon and you uh, talk with the folks there and make a presentation, and uh, obviously on the table is Afghanistan and Iraq, our involvement there. Going back to the foreign minister uh, in Oman, who shakes his head and says that because we didn't know and understand some of these things going in, we may have played it all wrong. Well, Dennis, I must uh, confess this. Uh, I've spoken at the Pentagon, in fact, recently, I've spoken at uh, Tampa, at uh, SOCOM, CENTCOM, and so on, and I've always found the military, the army, and I've, I've got links with the Naval, uh, the U.S. Naval Academy in Annapolis, mm -hmm. alert, well-educated, and very concerned about these issues. So I've never had this kind of brittle, well, is this uh, pro-American or anti-American position you're taking. It's always been very scholastic, academic, analytic. The reason being, Dennis, I often thought about this. These guys are in the front line, unlike you and me. They're actually out there, they're being shot at, they're, being, they're shooting back. So they need to understand what is going on on the mm -hmm. ground and devise effective ways of dealing with the situation. Mm -hmm. Their problem is, that the war on terror, the so-called war on terror, has been so dominated by ideology that they've had to very often do things which I think a lot of them were uncomfortable. General McChrystal, for example, mm -hmm. he said this publicly, he said this. I've quoted him in the book. He said, we virtually knew nothing about the Afghans. You know, mm -hmm. we went into this situation, highly tribal society. What did we know about it? Mm -hmm. How many Americans knew that the great empires of history have invaded Afghanistan? And one by one, in the end, at great cost to themselves, the Afghans have 
survived and in the end triumphed. So are you saying directly that you cannot steamroller a tribal society? You cannot because that is history and the greatest, the most famous, uh, certainly the most brilliant viceroy of India, Lord Curzon, early in the 20th century weighed the options mm -hmm. because he saw Waziristan as a real nuisance. And he said, how do I deal with this? And he said, all right, I cons I'm considering sending in the steamroller, which is just send in uh, the army and carpet bomb them and crush them and squash them. And then he said, no, I will not take this option. So again, the British were very pragmatic. And in the end, they came up with a brilliant administrative solution. They discovered the importance and the, uh, I think, the, the great solution of coming up with what was called the political agent. One officer from an elite cadre, uh, highly trained, fully responsible with all the authority of the judiciary, the executive, and the finance. And that officer, half governor, half ambassador, administered on behalf of the central government. Above all, he was just, he was fair, and he ensured the writ of the state and stability and peace in those tribal areas. We've talked about Islam, we've talked about uh, the tribal societies, we've talked about the central governments, and all of a sudden I would be totally remiss because confusion happens all over again if I didn't mention Boston, the bombers, you talk about homegrown terrorists, you uh, reference Chechnya and Dagestan in the book very clearly. It confuses all of us. How do you explain? I certainly understand the confusion of Americans, especially when you talk of tribalism. Because for Americans, Americans base their identity in citizenship. Tribalism was something that existed centuries ago. And for most Americans, tribalism means some Hollywood film and you have Apaches and Comanches and so on. And yet, we will benefit by learning of the Native Americans, their culture, their sense of honor and dignity, the way they balance their lives with nature itself. Now, if we can apply those principles to the tribes that we are encountering now in the Muslim world, it would help us deal with them much, much better. But the older of the brothers get so enmeshed into uh, Islam, the wife uh, gets involved in Islam, uh, changes her, her dress, her beliefs, he goes off to Dagestan, and it's all a blur in our minds. Exactly, Dennis said, in their minds, these are normal people who go around killing uh, uh, the very people who've been hospitable to them, mm -hmm. even according to the laws of tribalism. Mm -hmm. America, if America is a tribe for them, has opened its arms. It's welcomed these people. Mm -hmm. They have escaped a situation in, in their homeland and come here and been welcomed. And they, they for all pr practical purposes, they're like any other young uh, Americans. And yet, and yet, they indulge in this violence. So their behavior is totally to be condemned both on an Islamic level and tribalism. But Say that again. Say that again. Totally to be condemned both on an Islamic level. There's not an iota of justification for what they did on an Islamic level and tribal level. But having said that, let me say that they allow us here in the United States to begin to ask questions about tribal identity. Mm. And that, I think, is an opening we have which we must jump into and explore. Because what's happening in the Caucasus, in Chechnya, is worth a study. Uh, this problem in, the, in that part of the world is at least two centuries old. There's genocide in it, mm. there's murder, there's rape, there are all kinds of terrible things that are happening today, not in the ancient past. Mm. In the 1990s, when these two boys were being born and they grew up into men and um, inflicted their pain and their violence on us here in the United States, 10% of the entire population was wiped out, 10%. Mm, mm. And in the most brutal way, I mean, you're really talking about rape and torture and so on. Now, these people are coming out of a violent, broken society. Mm -hmm. And for them, the idea of compassion is now so fragmented, it, it's unreal. Mm -hmm. And you saw how they behaved. Their behavior is not normal at all. The thistle is whom? The thistle is the tribe representing this prickly flower and the great symbol, of course, used by Scotland, again, a traditional tribal society. And the drones, rendition, torture, special forces, that's morphed into the war on tribal Islam. Yes, say, yes. Because, because, Dennis, if you analyze this, where is the drone being used? The tribes in Afghanistan and Pakistan, Pashtun tribes. Yemen, tribes. Somalia, tribes. Eastern Turkey, the Kurds. These are all tribes that we anthropologists call segmentary lineage system, a certain kind of tribe, even within tribes. 
And if you see the correlation, drones and segmentary lineage systems. Now, if we know the problem is based there, we also know the solution lies there, and that is what I'm hoping this book will allow us to do, which is explore solutions in the tribal structures. That it is studying. called The Thistle and the Drone, How America's War on Terror Became a Global War on Tribal Islam. Thank you, Akbar. Thank you, Dennis. For information about my new book, The Chance of a Lifetime, an online video for all This Is America programs, visit our website, thisisamerica.net. And now you can follow us on Facebook and Twitter. This Is America is brought to you by the National Education Association, the nation's largest advocate for children and public education. The Republic of Kazakhstan in the heart of Eurasia, a rich history, a culture of hospitality, and a future of development and growth. The U.S.-China Education Trust and the F.Y. Chang Foundation. The League of Arab States, representing 350 million people in 22 member countries. The Rotondaro Family Trust. The Embassy Series, uniting people through musical diplomacy, presenting international artists in diplomatic settings.